And we're going to just uh, transition to the next panel. So you're welcome to stay on the Zoom. Don't go anywhere if you if you like. Um, and I'm just going to drop in the chat the name and all of that if I can right here. So welcome everyone to next our next panel, Negotiating Race in Mid-Century Music. And we have three panelists who I hope are on the line. I think I see everyone here. Um, Rudy Aguilar. Rudy, are you, yeah, did I, did I get your name right? Okay, good. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. RJ Smith is with us and John Villanova. So welcome, Rudy, RJ, and John. And uh, let's kick it off with, uh, we didn't discuss the order, but uh, Rudy, do you want to uh, jump in? Wonderful. Uh, just, uh, do I have sharing? Um, you should be yeah. a co-host and you should be able okay. to share. Yes. Okay. Let me see if I can share my PowerPoint with you all. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, for, uh, first and foremost, uh, to PopCon. I'm really happy that the conference is happening, uh, considering uh, the current uh, situation. Um, my uh, presentation title today is Can I Get a Witness? Historicizing Mexican-American Contributions in Minnesota Rock and Roll and Youth Culture 1950 to 1970. Uh, myself, I'm an assistant professor of Latinx Studies and American Studies at Kennesaw State University. Um, and just a little bit of background information on my project. Uh, this is part of a longer study that I'm trying to conduct and where it's, I'm trying to collect the, um, the history of Latino soul uh, in the Midwest. Um, I, I look uh, in the bigger project, I look at Chicago, I look at East Chicago and Gary, Indiana. Uh, I'm looking at Minnesota. And, and I may even uh, venture out to either Michigan or to Ohio. Uh, but, but really, it's just to sort of expand our knowledge on what we know as Latino soul. Uh, we know about uh, some of the garage rock and soul bands from the, from the West Coast, like the Midnighters and uh, Cannibal and the Headhunters, um, and, and maybe even a little bit of the Midwest with um, uh, Mysterious and the question marks, but I, I really want to get to some of the bands that have uh, less uh, recognition. And, and so this is why I, I want to delve into uh, Minnesota rock and roll for this particular presentation, because as we know, uh, rock and roll has uh, deep roots with black communities and, and just try to make sense of how some of the Mexican American bands really engage with black music, uh, be, uh, starting really uh, after the post-war period. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. And just to give a little bit of background information, um, when, when folks think about uh, Mexican communities in the Midwest primarily, they may think of Chicago, which is my hometown, but uh, as one of the, the bigger uh, hubs, but there are a number of of, of locations that we can think of with their own respective uh, historical uh, communities. Detroit had one as early uh, as the 19 teens, Kansas City, uh, Iowa, uh, Minnesota as well. And one of the things that really drew Mexicans to Minnesota was agriculture. And, and particularly the sugar beet uh, industry. Um, and, and that also included the areas like Fargo, uh, North Dakota or Northern Minnesota as well. Um, by the 19 teens, uh, 19 teens, 1920s, you started to see a, col a Mexican colonia, as the scholars called it, um, take shape on the west side of St. Paul. And even to this day, um, the, the west side community is, is uh, takes pride of its Mexican-American heritage. Um, and, and, and so you, if you were to go there, uh, the roots are very much cemented um, on, on that part of, of St. Paul, Minnesota. Some of the earlier uh, migrants that arrived to the area were either directly from Mexico, mostly central Mexico, or they also arrived from Texas. So uh, one can even consider them what some scholars call ethnic Mexican, a variety, uh, Mexican uh, uh, ethnicity, but um, a variety of, of national uh, um, and citizenship um, uh, status. Um, 
but many of them, they relied mostly on immigrant-run mutualistas or mutual aid societies, um, as, as they were oftentimes neglected um, by uh, a number of government officials. Uh, they also relied on what, what I would call whole house style uh, social services and organizations, right, uh, that attempted to Americanize Mexicans, right, make them, uh, th th at that point, uh, immigrant scholars and also uh, social service uh, employees believed that Mexicans could sort of um, live out sort of the linear assimilation that European immigrants were experiencing. Um, but unfortunately, what we saw uh, is that Mexicans experienced discrimination in housing. They oftentimes experienced de facto segregation or some form of redlining, uh, labor. Uh, they were, in many uh, regards, uh, heavily uh, dis um, uh, not welcome to join the unions or they were uh, recruited to work as strike breakers without their knowing uh, and in education even by the 40s and 50s you had very you had a high uh, dropout rate at the local high schools um, teachers and, and social workers were routing uh, Mexican Americans to more vocational uh, um, uh, fields similar to what was happening in in California and in the southwest um, and then eventually, uh, as Mexican Americans create a, a, a thriving uh, and at least a significant community on the West Side, um, they are eventually displaced uh, in what's called the West Side Flats. The West Side Flats was a community that was adjacent to the Mississippi River. It had experienced some uh, flooding, but at some point, uh, they, they uh, officials be began to talk about urban renewal, and eventually Mexican Americans were displaced um, uh, so that um, government officials can create a levy uh, to to stop the flooding, but never welcome them back. Uh, many of them uh, were not given the proper resources to uh, relocate in the 1960s. So I give you this backdrop information to sort of give you an understanding of how Mexicans dealt with uh, hardships, um, not only by moving up, migrating northward to um, an area that rather, was rather isolating to them, but also uh, not having the proper or not given the proper tools to quote unquote assimilate uh, similar to many other European counterparts. Um, so with that backdrop, I want to introduce you all to some um, uh, bands that I think have uh, gotten notoriety by maybe local historians of Minnesota history and culture, by some of the uh, newspaper journalists, but not really on a, on a national level. And, and one of those uh, individuals is the Augie Garcia Quintet group. And Augie Garcia, who was the front man of that band, was a very interesting figure. Um, he uh, loved music since he was a child. He was in a number of bands, uh, either uh, at school or maybe uh, with some family members. Uh, and, and just here's one, oh, excuse me. Let me just give you a little bit of uh, additional uh, information on Augie before I get to the pictures. Um, but at one point he was actually considered the godfather of Minnesota rock and roll. Um, that, that term is still kind of tossed around. Um, there was even a play of Augie Garcia uh, that was put together uh, by some uh, folks up in Minnesota. He too was raised uh, on the west side and on the west side flats before they were um, uh, displaced. Um, again, he sang in a number of Mexican and quote unquote Latin music bands during his youth. Uh, he also served in Korea. Uh, but what's interesting about Augie Garcia is that we, we kind of see over the years how his band transformed uh, racially. Not, um, the music, he was always in, enjoying jazz, uh, and at that point, uh, the emerging sounds of rock and roll. But uh, originally, his band had a number of, of ethnically European-American group, uh, uh, band members. So they were Italian-Americans, a number of Irish-Americans, some Chicanos on the band. Um, but then he goes to Korea, and when he returns, 
and tries to bring the band uh, back together, he made a conscious decision to recruit African-American band members. And that's the, the interesting thing about uh, the Augie Garcia Quintet. And some of the members that he included, I, I think it, it, it'll be very interesting to note, is uh, Maurice Turner, who turned out to be Prince's uncle. Uh, he also had James Cornbread Harris, who is the father of Jimmy Jam, who was also a part of the Prince, the early Prince circles of the late 70s and early 80s. But one of the claim to fame that Augie Garcia has is that he almost upstaged Elvis. Elvis came to perform uh, in Minnesota, I think it was 1956, um, and Augie Garcia was the opening act. Uh, and he, Augie by this time had a relatively big following in the cities. Uh, he had drawn a lot of excitement. Uh, and what ended up happening uh, is that his uh, performance on stage drew so much excitement uh, and, and, and the crowd was responding very positively uh, that the promoter actually went on stage and took removed, physically removed Augie Garcia from the stage because he did not want uh, Garcia to uh, show out the um, Elvis Presley. And so, so that's kind of one of his uh, claims of fame. Uh, uh, and, and his music uh, was heavily inspired uh, by, again, uh, rock and roll uh, and, and, and some of the other, and, and blues and some of the other uh, black sounds that were uh, emerging and, and very popular at the time. I want to just give you two photos of Augie. Here is um, a picture. Um, if, you, if you were to look uh, on the top right, he is the sixth person uh, from the right, top right. He's holding maracas. Um, and if you can see in this picture, there are a number of individuals uh, ho uh, wearing or donning uh, traditional Mexican and Latin American wear. There's a conga there. Augie Garcia himself is holding uh, a pair of maracas. Um, so, so this just kind of give you an idea of the type of music he was engaging with at a young age. Here's Augie uh, in his military um, uniform uh, as he was serving, as he served in Korea, uh, in the Korean War. And then eventually he would return back to the States um, and um, start his uh, band, Augie Garcia and the Quintet, uh, with the now uh, newly rebranded band that had more African Americans uh, performing in the group. Here I think is a unique quote that, that kind of like cements um, what, what Augie Garcia was trying to uh, reach or um, in his, uh, his decision of, of recruiting more black musicians, he said they, black musicians, were the only ones that had the soul. Uh, and this is what uh, Augie Garcia was quoted saying this about his black band members. Um, so, so he knew purposely that he needed to bring in uh, more than just uh, the uh, few Mexican-American members that he had and more than just the European-American uh, bandmates that he also uh, had in the group. Here's a picture of Augie. Um, and as you can see, um, <clears throat> you have an African-American um, saxophonist on the side. Uh, you have a, a gentleman by the last name of Lopez on the drums. And you had a number of other uh, musicians playing uh, in the uh, group itself, but 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 Augie Garcia's legacy does not stop with uh, his own group, and the reason it doesn't stop there is because then eventually, following uh, Augie Garcia, you get the J Mars. Rudy, I just want to jump in and let you know you have uh, we've run out of time, so if okay. you could maybe just wrap up and like. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, the J Mars all, were also from the West Side. Uh, his brother Bobby was actually a, a member of the J Mars. Uh, this is Augie's brother. They too were inspired by R and B and blues. Um, they oftentimes played uh, at a number of establishments in Minnesota, nonprofit centers. They eventually uh, put out their own record. Can I get a witness? Um, here's a picture of, of, uh, of a newspaper clipping of them performing at the YWCA. And the last thing I want to say is that 
their uh, engagement with rock and roll allowed them to have positive visibility despite the numerous institutions that wanted to believe that Mexicans were incapable of assimilating. Uh, Augie Garcia and the J. Mars engaged in what Lipset calls families of resemblance through engaging with black musicians and black music. Uh, and these bands cemented their presence in Minnesota rock and roll, uh, similar to the LA bands. Um, that's my time. I have the records, but um, if we have time later, maybe I could play some music. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, next up is uh, John Villanova. John, take it away. Uh, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get my screen share going. Just want to confirm everybody has a full screen view of uh, Stevie Wonder, my presentation. Perfect. Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm John Villanova. I'm professor of practice in journalism and Africana studies at Lehigh University. I uh, just want to thank the other panelists, uh, Jason, our moderator, uh, and the PopCon organizers for making this happen. Um, this is such a productive and meaningful intellectual space, and I'm really grateful to be able to uh, share as a part of it. A uh, brief interlude is, uh, you know, to let you all know that this is just a very small bite of a larger project that I've been working on for a number of years. It's a, it's my, it's a monograph, a book length monograph that's about the Grammy Awards uh, and the ways that they construct ideas about good music, uh, ideas about canonization, ideas about cultural, uh, collective, industrial memory through the canonization of the, of, of the major awards. year, the most prestigious category. Uh, he wins in 1973. That was the first time that a black artist had won that award. Uh, and generally speaking, what I focus on is when black artists musician is uh, in conversation and competition with white artists music. Um, and so the question that sort of launched this study, uh, this is one chapter, and this is one, you know, very small section of a chapter, is uh, what made the industry, the culture and the broader world ready for Stevie Wonder. And so what I did was that I analyzed uh, more than 7,000 newspaper and magazine articles uh, from the time period of Stevie Wonder signing his first Motown contract in 1961 until uh, the end of what's known as his golden period in 1977. Uh, you know, the goal in doing all of this was to understand why Stevie Wonder could stand apart, why he stood alone uh, in some ways. And I'm going to get at three of those reasons today. Uh, what I found was, you know, essentially a compelling history that sat at the intersection of race, individu uh, individuality, ability, uh, and excellence, a kind of real key word in, in this study, uh, and ultimately concluded that the way that Stevie Wonder was mediated, even as a child, prepared the nation for this ascent uh, as an individual, as an artist, and that that was written against certain long-held racist presumptions about Black music. This happened in three ways. The first was that Stevie Wonder was constructed as a curiosity. You'll see him here uh, in an advertisement that was in the early 1960s. He was an extra added attraction. Uh, and over the years, he rises up that. But the, initially, it was, uh, you know, as a literally a wonder, right? Uh, the second was as a figure of integration. We think about Stevie Wonder, uh, you know, very famously uh, working towards getting uh, Martin Luther King Day, uh, you know, sanctified as a, as a national holiday. But early on in his career, I'll show that he uh, espoused uh, more colorblind, uh, you know, post-racial uh, ideology in a lot of the ways that he sort of talked uh, about work. And the last would be a linking of merit and ability. Uh, that basically, Stevie Wonder, uh, his blindness was constructed in such a way that it created this narrative that he had achieved uh, quite a great deal and that that uh, purchase allowed him to be seen as an individual. And again, I just think that it's important to sort of give a little bit of theoretical context to this. Uh, and that is that what a lot of this work uh, and, and what a lot of why the music industry was ready for Stevie Wonder came because of long held racist ideas uh, about, about black music making. So if we go to, you know, early anthropological accounts, uh, there's this sort of notion that gets perpetuated and spread that if you just, you know, get a bunch of black people together, that music will emerge from them, that it is something that is cultural, it is something that is quotidian, it is something that is part of the day to day life. Uh, of being a black person, that it is not uh, the province of artists or of art. And we see this as something that a lot of folks have sort of talked about. And I think that when we think about Hitsville, right, when we think about Motown, uh, you know, you have a bunch of black teenagers together uh, and that people understood and received and were ready to receive this music as something that was, you know, fun party music that people enjoyed being around, listening to, dancing to, but that it wasn't art. 
uh, at least, and it wasn't worth, uh, you know, being remembered in the way that the Grammys were seeking to remember music until Stevie Wonder. Uh, and ultimately, that's how we get conclusions like this that Robert Christgau wrote in 1971 uh, when he called uh, Where I'm Coming From, the first album of this sort of great period, as an escape from Barry Gordy's plantation. Uh, so again, like I said, what I'll be doing today is just focusing very specifically on uh, the youthful Stevie Wonder and the construction of him. We have these three uh, modes by which this happens. He's Motown's youngest signee at 11 years old. Um, and again, they sort of dub him Little Stevie Wonder. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's there in the name that there was something wondrous uh, about him. He begins touring as a special attraction, but by 1964, he's performing on Ed Sullivan just a few weeks before the Beatles do. He's marketed like prior curiosities. I think that, you know, I, I really believe that Stevie Wonder occupies a very particular space, but if any forerunner uh, comes close to the space that he occupied, it was uh, Ray Charles. And one of the things that I found, I'm not sure if this is apocryphal or not, but it's been suggested that there was a thought about a Motown campaign in which they would market Stevie Wonder as Ray Charles's secret uh, illegitimate child. Uh, so that this connection was something that they thought was really important to kind of, uh, you know, parse out. And so without formal training uh, or musical school or anything like that, uh, a narrative that we saw applied to Ray Charles also applied to Stevie Wonder, which was that of genius. And so we see that marketing throughout the way that this is happening, that Stevie Wonder, there's something unique about him, uh, that he is a curiosity, that he is a genius, that he is exceptional. And I think that, you know, the, the, this, this is something that we see a lot in conversations around race music uh, and jazz and things like that as well. But as you see by, you know, later on in the 60s, he's got top billing. Uh, and he was afforded a lot of opportunities that other Motown artists were not. As a way of segueing into the next one, I'm going to play a brief clip from a beach party film. Now, children of the surf, do you think there are seven wonders of the world? Well, here's the eighth, little Stevie Wonder. <laughs> I'll go ahead and stop it right there. Uh, if, though, if, if any of you have any familiarity with this series of films which ran throughout the 1960s, they're rife with orientalizing and sort of, you know, fantastic uh, images where you have white surfers against this kind of primitive other. What we get here is what I've argued in other places is Stevie Wonder teaching white surfers how to dance. Uh, and doing so in a way that is welcoming uh, and non-threatening. Stevie Wonder was not threatening in the ways that a lot of other sort of, you know, uh, conspicuously racialized artists uh, were ah. for a number of reasons. Um, and in addition, like I said, we know Stevie Wonder as, you know, uh, the right, as happy birthday, but, um, you know, that, that, uh, that was not always the case. He said in 1969 that uh, color didn't affect him. Uh, he also, you know, really pushed against the sort of designation as a soul musician. Uh, you know, he aspired to something that looked more like crossover. Uh, he famously recorded uh, the anti-war song Blowing in the Wind and, uh, you know, in the news coverage of his performances around it, uh, he said that he didn't want to talk about his own opinions with the song, that he had just sort of, you know, enjoyed it. Uh, he said that he shouldn't get involved and that, uh, you know, folks should keep their mouths closed. Uh, and then again, this is sort of epitomized by this statement, which is a uh, both sides, uh, you know, uh, rhetoric that Wonder was sort of talking about. And this photo, this moment uh, during a performance in Washington, D.C., you can see a majority black crowd in the background uh, and, a, and a photo of uh, Stevie Wonder hugging First Lady Pat Nixon. And so again, this is wrapped up with the larger politics of integration and of crossover. Uh, and I think the one thing that's really kind of telling in all of this is that uh, at one point Wonder from a smaller uh, musical organization, not from the Grammys, but uh, was offered an award for best soul song for You Are the Sunshine of My Life. And he turned that down so that it was for him, it was kind of really important to be identified uh, in this way as an artist who was sort of, you know, carving his own way of representation, his own way of being. And that th a lot of this was tied to individuality. And so the third thing is kind of connecting to uh, the, the argument that was sort of made by all of this, that Stevie Wonder moved through the world as an individual. And in this case, uh, you know, this is a photo from a 1963 uh, magazine that talked about Stevie Wonder, and this is the photo caption. It says that he plays piano oblivious to everything but his music. There was this kind of spiritual connection that people said 
Stevie Wonder had with music. And so what's really striking is that blindness uh, kind of stands in for something. So here we have a, a high schooler who was interviewed in 1967, and he said that, uh, you know, Stevie Wonder had overcome two obstacles. Uh, he was, a, uh, you know, he was black and he was blind. But to balance those things out, he had a, he had a voice that uh, Stevie Wonder's preternatural musical ability was sort of, you know, rhetorically constructed uh, as a kind of trump card here. And that blindness oftentimes became, you know, sort of framed as a superpower, uh, an instinctive musical acumen. And what we can take away from that is that Stevie Wonder, uh, you know, he was a sort of, you know, living, breathing, singing uh, Horatio Alger story that, you know, it was a story of overcoming where uh, and this was very, very, uh, you know, emphatic uh, on sort of emphasizing the idea that he had done this as an individual, that he, you know, he got his place by doing it by himself, by pushing against, by being able to overcome uh, his blindness. And, uh, you know, in, in this quote that was syndicated and ran in dozens and dozens of newspapers for years, uh, he said, a handicap isn't a handicap unless you want it that way. And that is how, you know, I think that the combination of these three mediations is how we get to a place where by the late 1970s, Stevie Wonder can be this great, you know, uh, basically one of the first black artists who is understood as an individual and whose work is sort of really understood as artistic uh, and meaningfully sort of constructed uh, as such. And so that's everything for me. Here's kind of just a, you know, an overview of things uh, in general. And I'm happy to, you know, share more during Q&A if we have time for it and things like that. And happy just to, you know, be in conversation more about the work. Uh, so thanks for being here. Thank you so much, John. And uh, last but not least in this set is RJ Smith. RJ is still muted. All right, I think I'm in. All right, hello. Uh, okay, yes, so I'm gonna jump right in. It's great to be here. Uh, the Blues had a baby and they named it rock and roll. Go the lyrics to one celebrated Chicago blues song. When Dorothy and Harold Bloomfield had a baby in Chicago in 1943, they named him Mike. Harold and brother Daniel ran the family business, Bloomfield Industries, which made pie cases like you see in diners. They made uh, ice cream scoops. Uh, they made French fry presses, many things for kitchens and restaurants. Let me see if I can do this. Are you seeing my uh, ice cream scoop? Are you seeing an ice cream scoop? Uh, anybody? Not, not yet. Not yet. Uh, just make sure you're sharing screen all the way and click Yeah, that. let's see. That's going to be good in a second. Yeah, yeah maybe it's just got to load up. Uh, but it's, all right. There we go. All right. <laughs> it's very important to have an ice cream scoop in this presentation. Not really. but. Uh, so they, the company made those. Uh, and here is a, a family portrait uh, uh, of the Bloomfield family. If I can, uh, let's see. Well, it's not gonna cooperate on me. So there we go, there's the family portrait. Uh, on the corporate uh, website, uh, the caption on the corporate website says, uh, notice Harold, uh, the man on the left, that's the uh, owner of Bloomfield Industries. It says, notice Harold's judgy expression when observing his older son, that's Mike. Mike heard the radio, he picked up the guitar, and he never entered the family business. He loved Chuck Berry. When he was 15, he loved little Richard, James Burton, Gene Vincent. A year later, he heard the blues. A year after that, he was hanging out in the south side of Chicago clubs, listening to Muddy Waters, Otis Rush, Buddy Guy. And a few years after that, he becomes a celebrated guitar player of his own. Um, you know, he talked about, uh, as a player, a need to get it right when playing the blues, a kind of connoisseurship. Kind of uh, and also less often he talked about needing to get mad, to go crazy. Um, by the summer of 1965, he plays on Highway 61 Revisited, on Like a Rolling Stone. It, it, it's where Dylan knocked the certainty out of the connoisseur and he sounded mad crazy in the best possible way. That same year, Bloomfield backed Dylan at Newport. Dylan famously wanted him to join his band permanently, but Bloomfield turned him down because he wanted to play the blues. Around him hung an aura, a sly servant to his chosen musical form. On Rolling Stone's tally of the 100 greatest guitar players, Bloomfield lands in the 42nd slot ahead of Otis Rush, Hubert Sumlin, Muddy Waters, Robert Johnson, T-Bone Walker, Albert Collins, and Carroll. 
I'm not crazy about all his recordings. Um, he's a good guitar player. But what I love about him in particular is that he wrote a lively, honest, revealing, little known memoir of an experience he had before he became Mike Bloomfield. Uh, that's what I want to talk about today. Let's see here. All right. That is Big Joe Williams. Big Joe Williams was born Joseph Lee Williams in Octabeha County, Mississippi in 1903. He left sharecropping behind to play guitar in lumber camps and levee camps as a young man. He claimed Charlie Patton as a mentor. He recorded for Bluebird in the mid thirties. Big Joe Williams wrote the classic Baby Please Don't Go. Uh, he had his own extensive history with Bob Dylan. The two met Bloomfield and Williams in Chicago in the early sixties. Williams was living in the basement of the Jazz Record Mart at the time. In uh, about 15 or so years later, Bloomfield wrote a memoir of a road trip he took with Williams. Uh, it's called Me and Big Joe. Co-writer Scott Somerville took it to the research press in San Francisco in 1980. They printed perhaps a thousand, less than half that print run ever sold at the time. It's a chapbook by the end of 1980. Uh, it was republished in a different form in High Times Magazine with illustrations by R. Crumb. Bloomfield writes of Williams, he was a short and stout, heavy chested man, and he was old even then. He wore cowboy boots and cowboy hat and pleated pants pulled way up high, almost to his armpits. He played a nine string silver tone guitar, and to keep others from copying his style, he put it up in a very strange tuning. I was familiar with all stringed instruments, but I never learned to play it real well, and to this day, I don't know the tuning he used. Uh, I found this picture of one of his guitars, uh, this was on an auction site early this year, uh, and um, all I can say is the asking price for this nine string guitar is, I would just guess, you know, more than Big Joe Williams ever made in his lifetime for writing Baby Please Don't Go. Once he deciphered Williams' Piney-wood accent, Bloomfield learned quickly what an inviting and sociable force the older man could be, and the older man was happy to answer the younger man's questions. I'd say, Listen, Joe, do you know where Tampa Red's living? And Joe would say, sure, I know where Tampa's at. I'll take you right now. And we'd go. Joe takes him to meet Kokomo Arnold, Tommy McLennan, Jazz Gillum. You know, this is like fantasy camp for a white blues guitar player at the time. And Williams seems pleased to have this guy around who could really play and respected his story, understood aspects of his story. With a couple white buddies in tow, they go to Milwaukee where they visit Rice Miller, Sonny Boy Williamson. Uh, they go uh, to a roadhouse outside Gary, Indiana, and uh, they hear Lightning Hopkins and J.D. Lenoir. On the 4th of July in 1963, Williams announces he wants to go to visit some people he knows in St. Louis. He's fishing for a ride. Bloomfield hadn't been there, and he knew the blues scene was, was heavy, so he didn't agree to go. On the drive down, Williams is in a good mood, very talkative. He's reminiscing about Robert Johnson and Willie McTell and Blind Boy Fuller. Being with Joe was being with a history of the blues. You could see him as a legend, Bloomfield wrote. He couldn't read or write a word of English, but he had America memorized. From 40 years of hiking roads and riding rails, he was wise to every highway and byway and roadbed in the country, and wise to every city and county and township that they led to. Joe was part of a rare and banishing breed. He was a wanderer and a hobo and a blues singer, and he was an awesome man. And Bloomfield was a reader who definitely knew his on the road, his Nelson Algren, his James Agee. So they get to St. Louis. They're all staying at a sister or a sister-in-law or a stepsister of Joe's. Other people come into focus. It's unclear who she is. There are many children everywhere in this apartment. Uh, there's no place to crash. So uh, the guys get their guitars out. They get the peppermint schnapps and the gin out. I figured if Joe was going to get drunk and crazy, I was going to get drunk and crazy right along with him. It goes on, Bloomfield gets very sick all over the apartment. I woke up on a bed the next morning to find Joe standing over me. He had stayed up all night drinking and he was more than just drunk, he was on a bender. His nostrils were flared and his eyes were red and runny. A barbecue fork was in his hand and on it was a pig nose and hot grease from the nose was dripping on my chest. He opened his mouth and his schnapps breath hit me in a wave. Snoots, snoots, he shouted. I promised you barbecue and fine snoots is what we got. You thought you would get this, here is what I have for you. Or maybe in this era of Cobra Kai, you thought I was Mr. Miyagi, but I'm actually John Kreese. 
My head was throbbing and my stomach was queasy. And when I looked up, I saw this horribly fat and greasy pig nose an inch from my face. I lurched out of the bed and I threw up again. Joe began to curse me. Man, you puked all the damn night and into the morning and now you're puking up again. Can't you hold that stomach down? And what follows, don't have time for it. It's a picaresque, funny, it's grotesque. One that I think exposes the lie to the idea of the simplicity and even perhaps the possibility of such a mentorship between generations and classes and races. A chorus of upbraiding comes from the old man as, as they fight about where to go next. Don't you be telling me anywhere to go. Who is carrying who? Well, Bloomfield notes, it is my car and my friend George here, he's been doing all the driving. This is my city, he says, William says, and I'm doing the carrying and we're going to be with my people in my part of town. At one point, Big Joe stabs Bloomfield in the hand with a penknife. Bloomfield threatens to call the police. He does not. Uh, other bad things happen. Images of nausea and abandonment, human misery. And Bloomfield says, we're going back to Chicago. This, this, <laughs> we're going home. Big Joe Williams doesn't want to go home. He has to be dropped off in East St. Louis. So they drop him off on a dirt road. And they look out the rear view mirror. They see, uh, they see him hunched over with his with his uh, equipment and his suitcase, and uh, they feel bad. Bloomfield feels like the terminal break is upon him, and he doesn't want to lose his friend, so he comes back and begs Big Joe to come in the car. Because for better or for worse, here was a man of stature, he wrote. There was a great pride in this man, a great strength in this man, and there was poetry. He was a poet of the highways, and in the words of his songs, he could sing to you his life. And to hear him talk about Robert Johnson or Sunhouse or Charlie Patton, to hear life distilled. 50 years of thumbing rides and riding rails and playing joints, to hear of levees and work gangs and tent shows, of madams and whores, pimps and rounders, gamblers, bootleggers and roustabouts, of circus preachers, circuit preachers, and medicine show men. Well, it was something, because to know this man was to know the story of Black America. Maybe to know the story of black America is to know America itself. I mean, I don't know if Bloomfield himself believed what he was writing there because he has so fully in this memoir showed us a version of reality so out of harmony with the poetry he craves, with the poetry he responds to and that he echoes in that passage and elsewhere. Big Joe Williams says, no, you boys go on back to your people. You don't belong here. Later on, Bloomfield would write, I was a displaced person. I was a stranger in a strange land. I was a young white boy in a place where I shouldn't be. And I felt ashamed of that fact. Um, there's no way to unpack all this in, in the zero time we have left. But uh, I started thinking about this in terms of youth, the overall theme of this, uh, this, this, this year. And it turns out, I think that uh, there's a lot in this memoir uh, to unpack in terms of just recent months, in terms of the era of Jessica Krug and discussions of how white people could or should not be publicly supportive of Black Lives Matter. Uh, he, here was Mike Bloomfield sharing, you know, at the end of One Road, somebody else's story, not somebody else's story rather, but his own. So, thank you. Thank you so much, RJ. Yep, some applause. Applause for all three. Um, so we've only got a few minutes left, not a lot. Um, so we can open it up to questions. Um, you, uh, RJ, if you just want to stop sharing, you could do that if you, unless you want to keep it up there. Nope, nope. Okay, um, so we can open up to some, to some questions. If anyone has them, you can unmute yourself and you can ask directly. Um, also panelists, you can ask questions of yourself as well. I have a question. Can y'all hear me? We can. <laughs> and go ahead. That was uh, great. Thank you all for, it's always a joy to hear you, especially RJ, because your writing is so wonderful. Um, John, I have a question for you about Stevie uh, and your analysis. I'm pretty impressed. 7,000 texts you read. That's amazing. Uh, I've looked into this uh, far less than you have. But one thing I noticed was that uh, Stevie's often talked about as other black uh, child performers who then go on to become adult performers are also talked about like Chaka Khan, for example, or, or in his own memoir, in some ways, James Brown. 
as uh, performing labor as well. And I wondered if you saw a relationship between the idea of child labor and a uh, performer like Stevie. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm trying to think. I don't remember that being uh, something that was talked about. It was, you know, there was just so much talk of the fact that this, it, it, the, at least what I'm like re recalling is that, you know, that, that, that like, you know, narratives around the idea that Stevie never worked a day in his life because he loved this so much because he had such a sort of, you know, a sort of mythologized and mythological relationship to the music that he was making. Uh, it's mm -hmm. something that it sort of like, you know, runs throughout the ways that he's talked about. So like, you know, the, 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 after he has his car accident in the, in the, in the early seventies, uh, it's like the way that they sort of talk about knowing he was okay. was a sort of musical, construction. So I think that it, it, at least as far as far as I remember, and I think I'd be I'd be really curious to see about how this is talked about with regard to Motown in general mm -hmm. about child labor, but I don't I don't recall there being anything specific in what I had found on that, but it's a really interesting and profound way of sort of thinking about this for sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess I was literally talking about music as labor and you know, like they went to work at this very young age and I was thinking particularly of Shaka Khan who you know, there was one piece I found where the, it talked about how she had led this wild life as an 11 year old because her mom had her working in bars, which I don't think was that wild. It's interesting because much later, uh, Tori Amos had a similar childhood experience of working in piano bars and her father would take her to work in, in gay piano bars specifically, but you know, it was never characterized as a wild life. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I guess I should have qualified that and said music as labor. Oh yeah, no. Um, I mean, so I just like searched work really quickly in the manuscript and I have a quote from 1966 where it's talking about, let's see. Most of its artists describe Motown music as a family, but it's also schoolwork, play, religion, life. Artists spend eight hours a day at the studio, even when they're not recording. Ah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, don't, I, I didn't see anything about the, the, the music making itself as labor, but I don't, I don't know, there's probably more in there. Cool. Well, I'm excited to read this work you're doing. Yeah, I think Motown was definitely not going to be talking about <laughs> that work as labor. <laughs> Value extraction, maybe, you know. <laughs> Uh, any other questions for um, panelists or panelists, do you have questions for each other? I have a question for Rudy, actually. Um, one of the things is the, the kind of moral social panic that was, you know, the ways that rock was sort of represented in media in the 1950s because of its connections to black people. And I'm curious if there was any of that uh, in the ways that sort of uh, Mexican American and Mexican identity was connected to rock music. Were people worried about it from that specifically racial valence? I think, uh, at least in the case of Augie Garcia, um, <clears throat> it was more or less um, that uh, in, the, in the eyes of the public, of the popular uh, consensus, that Mexican Americans were just not, um, in their eyes, were not on this linear road to assimilation, right? And so, so I think that kind of like played into the way also they continue to be viewed, right? Um, and, and because of that, they, they were constantly viewed as unassimilable and also as a disposable source of labor. Um, one that you can bring up uh, whenever you wanted to, to the, to the Twin Cities or to Minnesota, and one that you can just get rid of at your, at your liking, right? They displaced them from the West Side Flats, but also then we also had a number of deportation campaigns, uh, one in the 50s, uh, Operation Wetback, that just basically if, if, if immigrants, uh, if they believe either ex exceeded their numerical presence, or even if they were, if they got out of line, especially undocumented immigrants, they would just uh, deport them. So, so I think there was more or less of that when it came to Mexican Americans. That's such an interesting. But, wonder... Yeah, and one of the things I do want to, uh, sorry to cut you off, John, but one of the things I do want to research more is if there was any blowback, because uh, this is still something in its early stages, but if there was any blowback for him recruiting uh, black musicians, that's something I want to, to look into a little more. Okay, anyone else want to add anything? Carlos dropped a nice, uh, um, some praise there for RJ's piece, if you saw that. Okay, all right, I think we should wrap up. 
um, just in the interest of time. So just want to thank our panelists uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you, John. Thank you, RJ. Thanks to PopCon. And we'll take a bit of a break. And then uh, we're going to be back. Actually, RJ's moderating, I think, when we come back. Um, the next block, uh, which is speculative selves, gender, race, and fantasy. So you can stick around for that and mute your video and all of that if you want to stay on or just log on again. Uh, it's Zoom Room 1, uh, Karen is saying on the text. So, okay, thanks everyone and cheers. Thank you.